Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project. This is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021, and welcome to the 65th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update, led by Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Gold is joined by MAVEN's physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Ramona Doyle, pulmonary and critical care, Dr. Lois Friedman, Psychiatry, Dr. Judy and Smith, Psychiatry, and Dr. Libby Sauter, Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. As you know, there's been great improvement um, across the US in terms of this pandemic. And with, the, with that great news, we have decided to decrease the frequency of Dr. Gold's amazing talks. Um, as of right now, we're going to continue weekly through the end of June. And if there's any change to that, we'll let you know. Um, and then we're gonna go to monthly starting in July. So it'll be the second Wednesday of the month, that's July 14th and then we'll do the second Wednesday um, in August as well. And with that, we um, are so grateful to Dr. Gold and to all of our physician volunteer panelists for participating. And we are um, hoping that people um, will be inspired to help to support the great work that the MAVEN Project has been doing. Um, and so we have this great little campaign slide. Uh, this is uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Ramona Doyle for the great um, little saying about wor wor worth her weight in gold. And you are diamonds and gold, Debbie, for sure. <laughs> um, we're very grateful to her for sharing her time and expertise to help our partners during the pandemic. And as you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, since March of last year, she's given 65 sessions. Um, and we invite you to support our work supporting frontline providers and serving underserved communities. And you can go to our website and feel free to make a monthly or one-time donation. Any amount, um, we're very appreciative of, and we're so appreciative of Dr. Gold. So you'll get this messaging a few times over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're, we're grateful for all of you who have been um, so loyal in attending. And other exciting news, we are planning to do a book discussion. Uh, the date is to be determined. It'll either be in July or August. And this is a book by the well-known author, Michael Lewis, called The Premonition About the Pandemic. And so if any of you are interested in getting the book and reading it, and then we'll have Dr. Gold, and then hopefully a couple of our um, public health department experts join her and have kind of an informal discussion um, about the book. So we'll keep you posted with that date. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Gold, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Woo. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, as I say, what I'm saying today is relevant to today because things are changing. As you're aware of a long agenda today, hopefully I will get through all of it. So worldwide cases, um, and whether these are accurate or not is highly debatable. I think they are probably grossly underreported, as I've said before. We are um, over 177 million cases and 3.8 million deaths worldwide. You can see here that um, cases appear to be decreasing worldwide, and that is probably largely related to the vaccine effort in the United States. With a, con uh, with a great decrease in numbers of cases in the United States. However, all of the countries in South America are still having huge numbers of cases um, and are contributing the most to worldwide cases, at least in the last week or so. Um, and then uh, there are still um, outbreaks in Asia and ongoing outbreak in India. Although overall, things are appear to be going down. In the United States, we're over 34 million cases, and these are worldometer data. Um, so the deaths are well over 600,000, although Johns Hopkins, I think, crossed the 600,000 death mark yesterday, only yesterday. Um, 
so these are the um, case re case data from um, the New York Times. Um, the thirteen, the seven day rolling average for the United States as of yesterday is uh, thirteen thousand seven hundred. There are now 24 states that are no longer reporting data on a daily basis. So I'm not really sure how these aggregating sites are um, reporting their data. And there are two states, Florida and Oklahoma, that are only reporting their data weekly. So if you're reporting your data just a couple of times a week or maybe just once a week, how you are going to de detect an outbreak is really beyond me. Um, but we'll see what happens. Even though we are at a, a state now that uh, uh, numbers, of, uh, numbers of cases wise that we have not seen since the very beginning of the pandemic, um, there are still eight states that are um, that have increasing numbers of cases now, um, and those are Alabama, Arkansas, Hawaii, Missouri, Nevada, Texas, Utah, and Wyoming. And of those eight states, only Hawaii is at uh, the 43% fully vaccinated mark, which is the average for the United States. All the other, uh, the other seven states all have lower vaccination uh, rates than the US average. So, um, so anyway, things are looking up here. We have been less than 15,000 cases a day since early June and um, staying and staying low in most, in most states. Hospitalizations are also um, decreasing over time. The seven day rolling average is 19,700 uh, as of a couple of days ago. The data are not updated now in the New York Times um, COVID tracking system, I think because of irregular support, uh, reporting from states. And likewise, the uh, seven day rolling average for deaths is down to 340 deaths a day. So that is greatly decreased. And again, we have not seen such low death rates since the beginning of the pandemic. So I wanna start out by just recommending this blog post by um, Paul Sachs, who's the Chief of Infectious Diseases at uh, Brigham and Women's. Um, and he has written this blog about why healthcare facilities should require COVID vaccination of their employees now and not wait. Um, and he presents some, I think, rather compelling arguments um, uh, and you might want to uh, take a look at that if you have um, employees in your facilities who are not yet vaccinated. Um, OSHA has issued some COVID rules for healthcare employers. So, and, uh, the, and this is true for uh, inpatient and outpatient facilities. Employers are obligated to provide PPE to their employees. They have to supply um, uh, adequate ventilation and spacing enough for social distancing when there's a possibility that uh, COVID infected patients are being seen. Um, screening and triaging patients for risk of COVID has to continue. Um, employers have to pay for time off for workers, not only to receive their vaccinations, but also in uh, to deal with side effects in case they develop um, symptoms which would prevent them from working. Fully vaccinated workers will not be required to wear masks or practice social distancing when they're in certain designated areas where COVID infected individuals are unlikely to be present. Interestingly, they did issue these rules for healthcare employers, but did not issue any COVID standards for meat packing industry, for correctional facilities, retail, or any other venue. But it's possible that those are coming. The CDC is now provo promoting vaccination of individuals in healthcare venues. Um, they are encouraging um, these venues to vaccinate patients before they leave hospitals, emergency rooms, and urgent care facilities. The rationale is that emergency rooms serve as primary healthcare access and sometimes the only healthcare access that individuals um, have, and that's true for about 20% of the population in the United States. Um, urgent care clinics handle almost 90 million patient visits a year, and that is more than 29% of all primary care visits and nearly 15% of all outpatient visits. So these are rich areas for capturing patients who may be unvaccinated 
Um, they are also trusted venues for patients and um, they might be uh, convinced to take a vaccine if they're offered it in the context of another doctor visit. So the CDC is advising um, state jurisdictions to allocate vaccines to emergency rooms and urgent cares directly and to prioritize facilities that are in counties with high social vulnerability indices. And I had talked about that, what that means last week, but those are um, communities where they're low income, many single parent households, um, lots of disabled people, um, et cetera. And those are the, the factors that um, are involved in determining what the social vulner vulnerability index is. The CDC has revised its uh, masking requirements for certain areas in public transportation. Um, and so they revised these uh, guidelines last week. And so now fully vaccinated people are no longer required to wear a mask in outdoor areas um, or outdoors at transportation hubs. And so that means if you are waiting for a train or a subway on an outdoor platform, you don't have to be that you don't have to be masked, but as soon as you enter the train or subway, you do have to be masked. Um, and so anyway, it's not a, a huge change, but um, I thought it was worth mentioning. Uh, the FDA has recalled the Innova Medical Group's uh, COVID antigen test. This was a class one recall, which is the most serious kind of recall um, of the 3T, 7T and 25T configurations of this test. I'm not really sure what those mean and it wasn't clear in the FDA letter, but they did say that SARS-CoV-2 antigen rapid qualitative test has been distributed in the United States without marketing approval, clearance, or authorization from the FDA and, quote, could present a serious risk to the public health. So evidently, Innova applied for emergency use authorization in August of 2020, but never received it, nor did they receive an FDA approval. And um, in the uh, letter that the FDA issued, they, the, they stated that the company falsified their data, inflating the test effectiveness and they suspected that they actually copied data from another product produced by another company into the data that they submitted to the uh, FDA for emergency use authorization. So it kind of made me think of whether there are other companies that are do have been doing the same thing. Um, there's been some update from the cruise ship industry, which I'm very interested in because of its connection to Florida and Florida's governor who has um, made a Florida state law um, that um, proof of vaccination is not necessary in any kind of business context. So Royal Caribbean Celebrity Cruises, uh, which is now um, uh, what do you call it? It's it's running out of St. Martin. I'm not sure that it's actually docking in Florida at this time. Um, they uh, they uh, embarked on the first fully vaccinated cruise in North America. So all um, passengers on this cruise had to prove that they had were fully vaccinated and they also had to show proof of a negative COVID test within 72 hours of boarding the vessel. Two asymptomatic passion, passengers who were sharing the same room tested positive during some routine onboard testing that was done before passengers left the ship. So those two passengers were isolated and contact tracing for them is ongoing. I haven't seen any other reports about secondary cases on the ship. And it crossed my mind that those individuals might have false positives, but why would you have a false positive test if you're roommates? So it seems like it seems more likely that those were actual real infections. Um, and then there were two unrelated passengers on this Mediterranean cruise that's operated by MSC, who tested positive again on routine onboard testing. These passengers were required to have two negative tests before boarding, but they were not required to be vaccinated. And um, these passengers and the individuals with whom they're traveling uh, were put into isolation 
um, before the rest of the passengers uh, disembarked in Sicily. Oh, those passengers disembarked in Sicily um, just to get them off the trip. And I haven't seen any follow up about whether there were secondary cases on this ship either. So um, CBS News did a poll between June 8th and 10th that was over involved over 2,000 um, individuals who were called um, to ask them some questions about how comfortable they felt with um, rolling back of um, masking protocols and, um, and other mitigation um, measures in states. And so they found that um, when asking people whether they were comfortable going into a bar or restaurant, fully vaccinated, 75% of fully vaccinated people said that they were now comfortable doing that, but 79% of individuals who said they had no intention of getting vaccinated were also comfortable going into a restaurant or bar. More scary is uh, when people were asked about their comfort going to a large event. So 42% or less than half of fully vaccinated people said they were comfortable going to a large event, but almost 60% of people who had no intention of getting vaccinated said they were comfortable going to a large event. So, um, the next time you're thinking about going to a large event, um, you might um, think about the unvaccinated people who are also there. Um, so speaking of large events, there was a Bitcoin convention in Miami, June 4th to 5th. And this convention, um, they, they sold 12,000 tickets um, to, for this uh, attendance at this convention. And um, it was held in a large warehouse, which I'm sure didn't have absolutely adequate ventilation. Um, there were attendees from all over the world, including many countries where vaccination is not available, not readily available. And um, these people were participating in panels and going to parties and basically making deals um, at this convention. And there were a bunch of posts after the convention indicating that there were many people who got COVID at the convention. And these are all people who saying everybody I hung out with got COVID, I got COVID, oh well. This woman says, just tested positive for COVID, probably got it at the Bitcoin conference in Miami, but whatever. And that's what I say to you, Sammy, whatever. Okay, so I, I um, anyway, we're, uh, this appears to have been a super spreader event um, in Miami. The World of Cement held a trade show last week in Las Vegas. There were 60,000 masonry professionals from all around the world. Again, many from countries that um, where vaccination is not um, readily available. And just consequently, Clark County, which is the county that Las Vegas is in, lifted most large group and social distancing requirements before they actually had went ahead with the convention. So masks were recommended but not required. And you can see from this photograph that I don't see anyone wearing a mask. Um, they, of course, didn't require vaccination, um, they, but however, they were doing temperature checks and enhanced cleaning and air filtration, which I think probably um, would not do much to, to limit transmission in this kind of a venue. So Moderna has applied for expansion of its emergency use authorization to uh, include kids between the ages of 12 and 17. As you'll recall, Pfizer got that EUA expansion last month. Um, Moderna has applied to the EUA um, and, and its um, request is based on data from a study of adolescents showing that the vaccination confers 100% efficacy from symptomatic infection. And in fact, a single dose provided 93% efficacy from symptomatic infections. It, they are planning to follow these kids for 12 months following their second dose just to ensure safety, um, to, to gather some more safety data. But there were no safety signals that were identified. There was an announcement on um, Monday from Novavax. This was a company that um, got into the vaccine uh, 
vaccine trial game late. They didn't start out until September of last year. Uh, but recall that Novavax is a recombinant nanoparticle protein-based adjuvanted COVID-19 vaccine. Is that enough? adjectives to describe their product. Um, just to remind you, the way this vaccine is made is that they take the DNA that uh, is translated from RNA that codes for the spike protein, and they insert that DNA into the DNA of a baculovirus, which is a, an insect virus, and they infect moth cells with this baculovirus. The DNA then goes to the cell nucleus, and that segment of um, spike protein DNA is translated into messenger RNA, which then exits the nucleus into the cytoplasm and is translated into spike protein. Those spike proteins are then expressed on the cell membrane, and basically they can go and mow them down and harvest those spike proteins where they then will associate with each other into these nanoparticles. And then the nanoparticles are mixed with an adjuvant, which is a saponin-based adjuvant. It's a proprietary product of the company to boost the immune response to the vaccine. This is the same technology that was used to create um, human papillomavirus vaccine. So their phase three study included almost 30,000 participants across 119 sites in the United States and Mexico. And the results showed that there was 91% efficacy in high-risk populations and 100% efficacy against variants that were not considered variants of concern or interest. So those are actually not the variants that we have been interested in. Um, there was 93% efficacy predominant against predominantly circulating variants of concern and variants of interest. So those would be um, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And um, all the COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths occurred in the placebo group. They did not identify any important safety signals. And they have an arm of the study that includes 12 to 18 year olds that is ongoing and there should be data from that arm um, in coming months. The company is intending to file for regulatory authorization in the United States in quarter three, but will um, proceed for uh, with uh, seeking regulatory um, authorization in uh, European and countries and other countries um, right away. I misspoke last week when I said that there were no well-documented um, deaths as a result of um, COVID vaccination. Thank you, Jan Gurley, for sending me this article about um, the investigation of nursing home deaths after Pfizer vaccination. So I think I mentioned weeks or months ago that Norway had identified I would say 150 deaths that occurred in nursing homes in very sick elderly patients um, temporarily related to receiving the Pfizer vaccination. And this article is a report of the expert group that was convened to look into these deaths to determine whether they were in fact related to um, receipt of Pfizer vaccination. So they, um, it, so we have to acknowledge that deaths of some nursing home residents after vaccination is going to be anticipated because deaths of nursing home residents occur frequently. And so, of course, there will be some deaths temporarily related to vaccination. But this expert group of four physicians, three of whom were geriatricians and one of whom was an infectious disease doctor, concluded that a causal link between vaccine and death was likely in 10 of the 100 cases that they reviewed, was possible in 26 of the cases, and was unlikely in 59 of the cases. None of them was definitely related to vaccine. And they acknowledged that there was considerable uncertainty about its, the panel's conclusions. And at the same time, they acknowledged that 
a risk of an adverse reaction to vaccine in a very frail patient could initiate a cascade of complications that could result in death. Now, I had some problems with this expert group investigation. And so while they did not lim um, list the limitations of their study, I pulled these out as things that I thought limited our ability to interpret their um, assessment of these cases. So first of all, one of the four reviewers had a financial conflict with Pfizer. Um, also, the reviewers had the adverse reaction reports that were filed by the providers. And they also had some basic information about the patients, their height, their weight, their medication list, and their functional status, but they didn't have the medical record. Um, and then when they asked the provider who um, um, filed the adverse reaction report for more information, only half of those providers sent them any more information. Um, there was a highly variable quality of information that was available in the adverse reaction reports. And further, and I should explain how they did this, um, this uh, evaluation, there were uh, four, in, four reviewers and two of them uh, reviewed 50 cases and the other two reviewed the other 50 cases. And the agreement between the reviewers was fair at best. There was a kappa value that was uh, calculated as 0.4, which is just a fair agreement between the reviewers. So even there, they couldn't, um, uh, they couldn't agree amongst themselves. And even when uh, the cases um, where they disagreed were then reviewed by a third reviewer, even then um, it didn't improve a lot. So um, I think that it, from this, it's still difficult to tell um, whether there was causation between vaccine and um, the death just based on this kind of analysis, but it's, I suppose it's, it is still possible. Um, I, they finally posted the slides from the ACIP working group on myocarditis that I've been looking for for the last like three weeks. Um, and this was, so these are slides about the dozens of cases that the um, CDC, that the ACIP was looking at um, following mRNA vaccine. And most of these were in adolescents that occurred within about four days of um, receipt of the second dose of vaccine. A smaller number developed um, pericarditis, myocarditis after the first dose of vaccine. So, it wasn't actually dozens of cases that were reported to the VAERS system, and that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It was actually closer to 800 cases, and they occurred both after Pfizer and Moderna. Um, as you'll recall, I had talked about the report from Israel where they had identified, I think, 35 cases in adolescent men, adolescent boys after Pfizer vaccine, because that's all they were using in Israel. But actually there were um, a fair number here also reported after Moderna vaccine, both after first and second cases. So overall, almost 800 cases were, have been reported to VAERS. Um, the median age is 30, um, but there are some very old people here who were included in this analysis. Um, and so those people are gonna be taken out. I'll, I'll show you on the next slide. Um, but the median time to symptom onset was two or three days. So that's consistent with the Israeli data. Um, most of them are men, but there were a third of, third of the cases after the first dose were women and 20% after the second dose were women. So um, a more mixed group than we've seen before. But this is the uh, interesting data that where they stratify by age. And so you can see here where they're looking at the expected number of cases and the observed number of cases. Down here in the older age groups, the number of observed cases are well within the expected numbers. It's only up here in the younger age group between 12 and 24 years. The, where only 9% of doses were administered, but over half of the cases of myocarditis, pericarditis were, um, 
were identified. And the number of observed cases are just far in excess of the number of, that were expected. Um, and these, again, are data from the VAERS um, reporting. The most common symptoms were chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, um, oh God, I am, I think this is, I can't see this because my uh, toolbar is down here, but I think that this was um, elevated troponin EKG changes. I know that this is echo and I could have these backwards, but maybe you can see the labeling on here. I just can't see that, it. Debbie, the 211 is the ST or T wave changes. And, the and then this is troponin. Is a okay. elevated cardiac enzymes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so the CDC has published some more real world data about that shows that these vaccines are working really well. So they asked the question, what was the effect of vaccine rollout in the United States on emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and deaths? Um, so important to know to understand this study is by May 1st, 82% of people over 65 and 63% and 42% of people, wait a minute, I think I made a mistake here in this slide. Oh, I left out something. Okay, 82% of people over 65, 63% of people between 50 and 64, and 42% of people 18 to 49 had received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. They looked at data from multiple surveillance programs across the United States and then also used census data to figure out how many people were in each age group. I'm going to uh, correct this slide, by the way, um, before it gets posted. So in case you're confused about what it says, you could go back and look at the slide. And what they did is they looked at trends by plotting weekly rate ratios, which compared um, events in people over the age of 65 with events in the younger age group, the 18 to 49 year olds between September 6th and May 1st. And so remember also that vaccine rollout started in uh, mid-December and then for everybody else in January of 2021. So there was a vaccine rollout during the course of this study. This means that, for example, if uh, hospitalizations for elderly people were starting to decrease, um, the rate ratio with the younger individuals would go down for that same for that same variable. So hopefully that's clear. So I'm going to show you the data here. These are the weekly rates for COVID-19 cases by age group and the rate ratios for people over 65 compared to the younger age group, 18 to 49. This is starting out in September and going out to May 1st. And you can see here, it's pretty flat. And then all of a sudden, in the end of January, that rate ratio starts to go down, meaning the number of infections in elderly people compared to younger people started to plummet. And then as we saw increasing cases um, starting um, in the spring in that last wave, uh, the rate ratio is starting to go up again, reflecting infection in elderly, probably in the elderly age group who had not received vaccination. This is the same data for um, emergency room visits. Again, the rate ratio kind of peaks. And then in the end of, uh, in January starts to go down very steeply. So uh, elderly people were not um, showing up in emergency rooms compared to younger um, individuals. And here are the same data for hospital admissions. Again, this steep decline. Um, and uh, this is deaths also um, in a more jagged way, uh, decreasing as death rates for um, elderly individuals decreased as their um, infections decreased, reflecting vaccination. However, um, there's something I wanted to say about this. Oh yeah, okay. So the decrease in the rate ratio for deaths started just after vaccinations were just starting to roll out in people over the age of 65. So vaccine coverage alone cannot, um, cannot explain this steep decline. Um, and it's unclear, there, there are other factors that have to be, that are at play here. So the conclusions of the study 
were that COVID-19 cases and severe outcomes are significantly reduced in populations with high vaccination coverage. But there were some significant limitations to the study. First of all, they used aggregated data, which does not account for variability in reporting or in vaccination coverage in different jurisdictions um, between rural and urban or by race and ethnicity. Populations that were eligible for vaccination and the timing that they were eligible varied across jurisdictions. And the analysis did not account for the spread of more transmissible variants, which was definitely happen happening during this time, um, especially with the alpha variant, the B117. Um, the implementation and relaxation of community level prevention policies in individual jurisdictions, which was just happening in different places at different times um, in different formulas all over the country. This is an update on citrovimab, the uh, monoclonal antibody that I discussed maybe last week or the week before, which um, does have activity against um, the circulating variants and will be available in all 50 states. But, um, and you can get a uh, fact sheets for providers and for patients about this, but um, the product is not gonna be available weeks. Um, so it's unclear what's holding that up since I believe they did get emergency use authorization already. Um, so this is a paper that appeared, um, uh, that was published from a group in Naples about chillblains uh, or covatose, and I've talked about this a couple of times before. Um, and um, there was a study even bigger than this one that was reported from Belgium of 31 patients with uh, outpatients with chillblains during the peak of COVID. Um, in that country, and they looked high and low for evidence of SARS-CoV-2 um, in these uh, in those individuals serologically and in biopsies, and they found absolutely no evidence of SARS-CoV-2. The data in this paper are similar. This was a prospective case series that asked the question: Are chillblain-like lesions of the toes? associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection, or is the association merely temporal? So they had 17 healthy adolescents who presented with chillblains lesions between April and June of last year at a tertiary facility in Naples. Um, they did clinical examination. They worked them up lab-wise with everything, CBC, metabolic panel, uh, complements, autoimmune panel, um, uh, uh, serologies um, at the time they presented and then follow up at a month. Um, and they also did biopsies of them and, uh, and dermoscopy. So they did a follow up at four weeks. Uh, again, it was clinical lab and um, basically looking for anything that might indicate that SARS-CoV-2 was um, actively involved in this process. These are just some photographs of the chillblains lesions on the toes. And incidentally, there were also lesions on the heels. They didn't um, include any of those in the, um, in the photographs, however. So they found that no patient had a history of autoimmunity or any lab signs of underlying autoimmune, inflammatory, or proliferative conditions. The onset of lesions was not preceded by any prodromal symptoms, nor were there any symptoms of COVID that, that um, occurred after the onset of the, of the COVID toes. Um, the most common symptoms were pain, swelling, itching, burning. All the patients had normal labs except for mild elevation of C3 in 10 of the 17 kids. Molecular tests for, were negative for, for SARS-CoV-2 in all patients. Oh, I forgot to say they had nasopharyngeal swabs for PCR, um, both at, um, at presentation and at follow-up. And then quantitative um, antibodies for SARS-CoV-2, IgM and IgG, were negative in all the patients at enrollment and at follow-up. And then, of course, they did in situ hybridization. They did not identify any viral RNA in any of the biopsies. There were seven of the enrolled kids in the study who relapsed in the winter months and tested again negative for um, anything related to SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
So the data did not support an association of chilblains with SARS-CoV-2 infection. They thought that maybe walking around barefoot at home related to the lockdown um, uh, might have contributed to the onset of lesions, especially as the weather got colder. Um, and they thought that maybe an increase in emphasis by the media on the pandemic and the associated clinical manifestations, particularly chillblains, might have contributed to increased attention and milder cases that would not ordinarily have had medical attention all now got medical attention. So um, I think there are really not very good data um, now. There are great data to suggest that this was true, true, unrelated. Um, so I wanna um, review the nomenclature for the variants again, cause I'm gonna be using this, these um, names going forward. In particular today, I'm gonna be talking about um, UK B117, which is alpha, that's the UK variant. And the um, variant from India B1617.2, and that is the Delta variant. Um, and the literature is using those, uh, those names now more and more consistently. So hopefully um, the, they won't sound so um, foreign as I use them more and more. Um, these are data from the UK um, that show that the Delta variant from India is spreading very rapidly in the UK and also is present in now more than 60 countries. Um, and you can see here that in the last, in the uh, one week, there were almost 30,000 new cases of infection identified with this variant. And I think it's um, very, uh, these are some data from Scotland that just show you how um, the Delta variant has taken over um, the circulating strains in the UK. This is looking back at January where almost everything was alpha or B117. And then going along in time, the pink is the Delta variant, which has just been rapidly over a period of um, five months becoming the dominant variant um, that's circulating in the UK and is almost three quarters of all um, uh, circulating strains right now that are, have been identified. In the United States, we still are seeing mostly uh, B117. That's about 70% of all isolates that have been um, sequenced. And these are the data that were reported even as recently as this morning, only going through May 22nd, showing um, that the um, that the Delta variant was only 2.7% here. I think the week before it was 1.3%, um, but the um, word out of the COVID, um, the, out of the White House and from yesterday is that um, the Delta variant is now 10% of um, isolates that have been sequenced in the United States. So it's rising rapidly. And I think that outbreaks in uh, communities where um, vaccination rates are very low, particularly in the southern states, um, those outbreaks are going to be uh, are going to be caused by del this Delta variant. Um, these are some other data coming out of Public Health England. Um, this was a press release May twenty second that I did not see until the other day, um, but it was an analysis of data for over a thousand people who had confirmed infection with the Delta variant between April fifth, um, and that's uh, covering the period when the Delta variant became prom the predominant circulating strain. Um, the Pfizer vaccine was 88% effective against symptomatic disease from the Delta variant two weeks after the second dose, compared with 93% effectiveness against B117, the alpha variant. AstraZeneca was a, a less effective, 60% effective against symptomatic disease from Delta two weeks after the second dose, compared with 66% effectiveness against alpha variant. Now remember that in the UK, they were delaying second doses. That became the government's policy. And so they were not going to administer second doses until 12 weeks after the first dose. So they got kind of behind the, the eight ball on this. Um, both vaccines were only 33% effective against symptomatic disease from the Delta variant three weeks after the first dose 
compared to 50% effective against the alpha variant. So they are not in a good place right now and are gonna have to scramble to get those second doses into people in order to try to curtail this, out, um, this circulation of this um, particular strain. The um, predominance of the Delta variant is pushing back Freedom Day or the day that they were supposed to um, roll back all of the mitigation measures in the UK. They're gonna push that back four weeks because of this problem. Um, the Delta variant, oh, you know what? I forgot to say something important. Yesterday, the CDC designated Delta as a variant of concern. Um, we've known for quite a while that it confers 60% increased transmissibility um, compared to the alpha variant or B117, but um, for some reason, the CDC did not see fit to designate Delta as a, a variant of concern, but now maybe based on these data from Scotland, um, they went ahead and, and made that designation. So this was a cohort study that asked the question, is infection with the Delta variant associated with increased risk for hospital admission from COVID-19? This was actually a huge study that was looking at many other issues, not just hospitalization, but I'm just gonna show you the data for hospitalization. So this was data from the EVE2 Scotland-wide uh, surveillance platform that, um, and it, they're gonna, they're looking at data between April 1st and June 6th of this year. They had almost 20,000 confirmed um, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections over this period of time, and 377 of them were admitted to the hospital for COVID-19. And they defined a COVID-19 hospital admission as a SARS-CoV-2 positive test within 14 days before or two days after a hospital admission. They used S-gene negative or S-gene dropout as a surrogate for identification of an alpha variant and S gene positivity as a surrogate for um, a delta identification of a delta variant for ease of identification um, for the purposes of this study. And these are numbers of individuals testing positive who were admitted to the hospital. And you can see if you look at the rate per 100 person years, for S gene negative or the alpha variant, the rate is 36 per 100 person years. And for the delta variant, 62.4 per 100 person years. So almost a doubling of um, rate of hospitalization from the delta variant. Um, and you can see here, this is looking at um, hospitalization, uh, hazard ratio for hospitalization um, stratified by um, number of risk factors. So individuals who had only one risk factor had a 64% ch increased chance of hospitalization compared to um, B117 individuals um, infected with B117 or the alpha variant. Um, individuals who had two risk factors were 77% more likely to have hosp be hospitalized. And going down here with five or more risk factors, um, there they were um, six and a half more times to require hospitalization compared to similar individuals who were infected with the um, alpha variant. And then this is looking at individuals with um, vaccination status and basically individuals who had a single dose of vaccine who were within 27 days of that vaccine um, were somewhat protected, um, were somewhat protected, but once you get down to the bottom where they've had two doses of vaccine and are beyond 28 days, those are individuals who have the lowest um, risk or um, the uh, lowest risk for hospitalization. So the conclusions were that the Delta variant in Scotland was found mainly, uh, mainly in younger, more affluent groups. And I didn't show you data for that, but just so you know, that's, the, 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 that's what their data showed. The risk of COVID-19 hospital admission was, was doubled in those with Delta infection compared with those with alpha infection. And the risk of admission was, was increased with increasing, an increasing number of comorbidities. I have one more paper to present um, this uh, white paper on long COVID. And I think I'm gonna actually 
wait until next week because it's going to take me quite a while to get through that. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to entertain questions. Great. Dr. Gold, thank you so much. Fantastic as always. And we have a lot of great questions here. Um, let's see, one of our providers will be meeting with a Kenyan group virtually um, to field questions about getting vaccinated. Uh, this is going to be happening on Thursday. Can you share any like reminders of sort of like basic facts and explanations? I mean, if you were meeting with a group of Kenyans about getting vaccinated? Are they physicians? Or I uh, or um, let's see, let me just, you know, the messaging has to be really tail tailored to the audience. So if these are individuals who are resistant to getting back, who are not vaccinated because they can't access vaccine because there, there's not much availability in Kenya, then that, that would be one thing. But if they are resistant because of fears of um, infertility or religious objections or whatever, I think the messaging has to be really tailored to um, the, the, the audience. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Roach. Um, this is a group of Kenyans in Seattle who are vaccine hesitant. Oh, and do you know why they're vaccine hesitant? I'm going to find out when I'm live with them. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Just listening to <laughs> why they are hesitant, that's gonna sort of inform your messaging to them. Um, and listening to why they're, you, you have to hear them out and then just try and um, comment on all of their unfounded fears one by one. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a more specific um, line to, you're just going to have to listen to them, and that's what the you know the nurses and other providers who go into these mobile clinics, mobile vaccination clinics, into communities where they're very resistant to vaccination. Um, they just they listen, they just hear them out, and then they just slowly start chipping away um, at their fears. I and, think one one question I have is that I'm pretty sure. So the mRNA vaccine, this is brand new technology. We don't have another vaccine that we're already giving that uses the same technology, is that correct? That's right, that's right. But you know, the, and, and you can look up online on the, the day that you have, uh, that you're gonna talk to them and see how many millions of doses have been administered. Um, and really how, you know, and the data show that it's very well tolerated and um, there has been no support for effect on fertility. And that might be, you know, that's a driver in a lot of communities, even in nurses, they think it's going to affect their fertility. When like I what? In, you when know, I was in Kenya. People were very concerned about fertility, side effects of even aid food. Can, can, did you just hear that? Yeah. So, um, this is my friend, Ruth. <laughs> we trained together and we were ID fellows together and she spent a lot of time in Kenya when she was, a uh, when you were a medical student. No, no, when I was a fellow. Oh yeah. When you, she was a fellow. Okay. So say what you said about. <laughs> well, when that. I was in Kenya, I was actually there twice and there was just a lot of, um, lore around that things like aid food, Western interventions, were um, causing infertility, like that was a side effect. And I actually thought it might have been a Russian trope then to cause distrust in the West. But anyhow, um, hearing that Kenyans are concerned about this reminds me of my experience in Kenya. Okay, thank you, Ruth. So um, the infertility thing, that's big and it's not unique to this vaccine. It's, it's an old trope that's you know, that's been dragged out for other um, other medical interventions too, affecting fertility, and it's really effective in getting people to reject that reject technology. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Roach. And we'd be interested in follow up about how your conversation goes. Um, this is from Dr. Sauter. Do you think that the younger age group adolescents, young adults age twenty one to thirty, are hard to convince to get vaccinated? that if they were made aware of the same technology to produce the Novavax were used in the HPV, the Gardasil vaccine that they probably already received that they may then be convinced to get vaccinated? I don't know. And maybe they didn't receive that vaccine but it's certainly worth a try. 
Yeah, um, I'm starting to think well received in you know the pediatrician's office, at least up here in the Northeast. Um, but, but that's your mom dragging you in to get that vaccine, right? What? That's your mom dragging you in to get the vax that HPV. Right. So if you have parents that won't vaccinate their kids because they're afraid of what it's going to do, if it's a vaccine that they know has been already used within their child, you know, the technology has already been used that oh, maybe uh -huh. then. Yeah. And if so, so maybe that's the one that's going to be used uh, if it gets the approval um, widespread internationally. Yeah, so it's unlikely that Novavax is going to be um, a, a big part of the market in the United States just because Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson have really, uh, we have enough of those doses to vaccinate everyone. Uh, yeah. So Novavax is probably going to be used in the EU and in other, in other continents. Um, it, it's too bad because that might have been a way to convince the you know under 30 population that has already received the HPV vaccine. That it's a good idea. Yeah. Doing okay right now, you know? Yeah. Well. Great, thank you. Can you summarize about myocarditis again, what the take -up, your take home point is? Um, no deaths. If you were asked um, a patient, um, if you would give Moderna to a young person, how would you answer? Um, I absolutely would. And all the stuff that has come out from the ACIP, from their working group on myocarditis, is that this is not a reason not to give uh, an mRNA vaccine. It is not a reason to give a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the risk of uh, COVID is far greater than the risk of myocarditis, which has still been identified in just a sm relatively small number of individuals considering that um, hundreds of millions of doses that have been administered so far. Um, these kids actually tend to do very well, um, even if they get myocarditis, if they even get into the hospital, and a lot of them don't, they just spend a few days there. They don't seem to have long-term sequelae. And, um, you know, it seems to be quite mild when they do get it, if they do get it. And I think the risk is very low. Thank you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, preferentially give um, a Johnson & Johnson vaccine to a kid just because I was afraid um, that the kid was going to get myocarditis. I, you know, if my kids were, my kids are in that age group, and if they were not vaccinated, I would want them to get an mRNA vaccine because I actually think that the need for a booster will not be um, I think the risk for needing a booster from waning immunity will be much lower with an mRNA vaccine than with Johnson & Johnson. Thank you. What specific antibody tests should be obtained for those who have been fully vaccinated but have a weakened immune system? So if you want to go there and you understand the limitations of getting a single antibody test, you have to get an antibody test that measures antibody to spike protein. A lot of the antibody tests that are available commercially will measure antibody to nucleocapsid, and that doesn't tell you, that only tells you about natural infection. It doesn't tell you about, um, and, um, it doesn't tell you about antibody specifically to vaccines, so you need an antibody test for spike protein. Um, if that antibody test is positive, unless you have a titer or some other kind of quantitation, it also doesn't tell you how much is there. So you may just have just above the level of detection and it doesn't, and you wouldn't know that um, if it's just give, gonna give you a plus minus um, result and not a quantitation. Um, also, if it, so if it's negative, it helps you, it means you don't, you haven't made antibody. And if that can be a surrogate for a general immune response, you may not have made any T cell response either. And that, that's kind of unclear at this point, but might be the case. Um, if it's positive though, it doesn't tell you how much antibody you have. If you do get an antibody test against spike and you do have detectable antibody and it's quanti quantified, um, it's helpful to get a second test at some other interval like um, three months or six months so that you can understand what the kinetics are of, um, of, the, of your immune response and whether it's um, degrading quickly or not. Thank you. Do you think that these facilities vaccinating people um, in DC should use a single dose vaccine? Can you repeat the question? 
Um, this is from Dr. Hurwitz, Dave. Let me see if you can uh, explain. Unmute him. Right, yep. <laughs> uh, so Hi, Dr. Dave. Hurwitz, can you clarify your question? Sure, I meant discharge. Uh, people oh, were discharged. should they get a Johnson & oh, Johnson? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry you know about what? that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I think um, getting a single, I think that's a really good, um, uh, um, it's a really good strategy to use a Johnson & Johnson out the door because then you don't have to worry about tracking them down again to try and give them the second dose. Um, and I think that's a perfect use for Johnson & Johnson. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so I thought, I don't know what they're doing in Washington, D.C. <laughs> really? That was my, yeah. that was my bad. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Uh, this is from Dr. Gurley. Uh, the Royal Caribbean Cruise has now also disclosed that eight crew members have tested positive from the same 100% vaccinated cruise where two passengers tested positive, and she had included a link in the Q&A box. So, oh, thank you, Jan. Wow. So... I'll bet you the crew members were the, well, maybe not. I guess it's hard to tell, but they're doing contact tracing clearly. So that's awesome. Thank you, Jan. What is the real risk to those of us who are fully vaccinated in being in an indoor setting, restaurant, bar, concert, show, if there are unvaccinated and possibly asymptomatic carriers of COVID there too? I think the risk is very low. I went into a bookstore yesterday and I was not wearing a mask. And I was in there for at least 10 minutes. I think the risk, if you're fully vaccinated and you're an immunologically normal person, I think the risk is very low. I, the risk is gonna be to individuals who are not vaccinated and who are you know, also in that bookstore and one and asymptomatically infected or symptomatically infected and going in the bookstore anyway, and they're gonna transmit to the other people in the bookstore. Um, I think that's gonna be the risk, but I think I, I feel um, very protected. Thanks. Although I haven't eaten indoors yet, I probably will do that soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The issue of increasing the vaccination rate in the US remains a big challenge. Uh, there's a series of questions. The first is hospitals require um, a flu vaccination for providers and hospitals. Why can't th this be mandated to extend to all healthcare workers for COVID before allowing them to work? I think that that should be what the policy is. I don't think that they should wait until the FDA gives formal approval. We have a lot of data now. Um, not all, we have efficacy data, we have a f real world effectiveness data, and we have safety data that suggests that this is, these vaccines are very effective and very safe, and they should be required for employment in healthcare facilities and in other facilities too, I think, but starting in healthcare facilities. And I think that the argument that Paul Sachs puts out in his blog is very compelling and would support that. Um, there are gonna be people coming into healthcare facilities who, who may be fully vaccinated, who have not mounted a robust or durable response to vaccine, and they're gonna be vulnerable. And those unvaccinated healthcare workers will be able to transmit infection to them. And there is no excuse for that happening in a healthcare facility. Thank you. Um, Dr. Winston, I'm gonna just move on to uh, get some other people's questions in as well, but thank you for submitting yours. Um, please comment on significantly low protection to Delta virus after one jab of vaccine compared to other variants. Yeah, so it's just, it's, um, it's not very good after a single, after a single shot. Um, and so two shots are necessary to confer, um, you know, reasonable protection. Um, why that is, why that's the case, I'm not really sure, but so it is. And um, the UK is now having to rethink their delay the second shot strategy um, because of this problem. Um, and fortunately, we didn't practice that same strategy here in the United States, um, especially since the Delta variant seems to be um, more than doubling every week in its prevalence. Um, so, yeah. Is there data? Wait, I want to just say something about requiring vaccinations. It wasn't until, I don't know, six or seven years ago 
maybe a little bit longer that healthcare workers, at least in the city and county of San Francisco, were required to take a flu shot. Um, we, have, we have great difficulty in requiring healthcare workers to take vaccinations that would clearly have benefit uh, to protect other healthcare workers and patients, it, it, which is just astonishing to me. So um, I think we need to step up and, and get this done for healthcare workers. Anyway, okay, go, sorry. Is there data that shows the rate of U.S. hospitalizations, ICU admissions, post-COVID morbidity and mortality stratified according to vaccination status? I have not seen that kind of data. Um, there are very few hospitalizations of fully vaccinated people. I think there have been, um, uh, I think of maybe 181 or 188 hospitalizations of fully vaccinated people. That may be the deaths. I can't, uh, oh, I can't remember. Anyway, the numbers are really small. Um, right now, the, um, the CDC is actively investigating all hospitalizations and deaths in fully vaccinated people, but I haven't seen any um, data from the CDC or anyone else um, about uh, looking at, at that. Thank you. I'm sure we will. Yeah, um, Dr. Holly just had a follow-up uh, recommendation regarding um, Dr. Roach's upcoming conversation with the Kenyan community in Seattle. She says um, you can use the um, app slash resource from Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center. Um, I think maybe you had previously shared information um, from Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center about talking to different cultural groups. Um, let's see, what is the effectiveness of the Moderna vaccine, vaccine against the Delta variant? Um, I haven't seen any data for, um, for Moderna, but I suspect that it would be virtually identical to Pfizer just because the two vaccines are so, you know, they're very closely related. Right. Is there a risk of getting myocarditis after COVID, the flu, or adenovirus infection? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, there is, but I couldn't say what the risk is. It's pretty low. I've never seen um, I've never seen a case after influenza. I don't think I've ever seen a case of adeno, but certainly we're we're right entering um, myocarditis season right now. Um, enteroviruses are the most common viruses that cause um, myocarditis. Um, so you can, you know, there are lots of viruses that cause it um, and you can get it from influenza. And so, um, and, you know, I don't remember if you, yeah, I think you can get it from COVID too. Yeah, um, yeah you can get it. Yeah, the athletes had myocarditis. Um, the uh, college athletes, they had myocarditis. That's why they were kept off the field. So, great. We have the Norway nursing home data on possible link to vaccine and deaths. What about U.S. data on deaths? Do you have a source? I haven't seen here? any. I haven't seen any. Has anybody? Maybe Jan knows or. Um, oh, Sue Adler says 188 deaths and 2,000 hospitalizations in the first 100 million doses um, of a vaccine administered in the United States. Thank you, Sue. Great. I've known yeah. Sue Adler since sixth grade. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, this will be the last question. When is the standard FDA approval rather than the EUA expected for vaccines? This might help um, gastroenterologists increase the vaccination rate for those who feel concerned about the rushed approval, no? Um, I don't know. I think it's in the next few months that there's going to be um, formal FDA approval. I don't, um, I haven't heard of a, a specific date that that was going to happen, um, but I don't think we should, you know, I don't think that you, we should wait and people should continue to receive this vaccine under emergency use authorization and they should be reassured that it's safe and effective. Thanks. And then um, Sue Adler, if you could type in um, 
the source that you used for um, the- I know what, I don't know what the source, I can put it in the references. It, it's off the CDC website under um, breakthrough infections. Great. And then Dr. Smith shares, a friend of hers runs the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics COVID treatment. He told her that none of the hospitalized patients for COVID had been vaccinated in the last one and a half months. He has had multiple patients pleading that they'd get the vaccine as he intimates, intimates them. Some of them have gone on to die. So it's, it's awful. Very sad. Very, very sad. Well, on that note, <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Gold, thank you so much again for a terrific session and great um, question and answer discussion. Thank you all for your terrific questions. We love that. We look forward to seeing you all next week, same time and same place. As a reminder, in July and August, um, we'll just be offering this session once in the month. It'll be the second Wednesday of the month. And for those of you interested in reading the Michael Lewis book, The Premonition, A Pandemic Story, go ahead and start reading that. And we're going to set a date, and Debbie, maybe it could even actually be the August session um, to have a little book discussion um, about that. So um, I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Great to see you and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>